So hello everyone and welcome to UC San Diego Rady School of Management's online masterclass series brought to you by the MBA admissions team. Today's masterclass is called How Supply Chains Change the Retail Industry with Professor Hyoda Shin. Before we get started, I'd like to share some basic information with each of you. Today's class is scheduled to last up to 45 minutes. Questions can be submitted anytime in the chat portal. And as your moderator, I may be able to answer your question immediately or during the presentation or to schedule a personal advising session for any of our graduate programs, please email radygradadmissions at ucsd.edu. So um, I'm Amy Huen. I'm the MBA graduate admissions coordinator. I've been working at Rady for almost two years now. I actually originally came from Virginia and moved to San Diego two years ago. I previously worked in real estate finance, but wanted to pivot to working with students um, in a collegiate setting. And so I um, started working at Rady. And I'm actually currently in the Flex Evening MBA program. So if you want any, if you have any questions about um, the program itself, you feel, feel free to ask me about my own experiences. So before I welcome Professor Shin to lead us through a masterclass on how supply chains change the retail industry, I would like to take a moment to share with you the Rady School's mission, which is at the heart of everything we do. Here at the Rady School, it is our mission to develop ethical and entrepreneurial leaders who make a positive impact in the world through innovation, collaboration, and knowledge. The Rady School students, alumni, and faculty over the last 17 years have developed over 180 companies, benefiting and impacting the innovation economy of our region, state, country, and the world. As our second dean at the helm, Lisa, uh, Dean Lisa Ordonez intends to transition the school from a startup to focus on growth and further cement the school's business research prominence and impact as an innovation focused economic engine within the San Diego business community and beyond. If you're nodding and agreeing with this mission, then you know Rady is the right business school for you. The Rady School's graduate programs cover a range of disciplines from the flagship MBA to our specialized programs in business analytics, professional accountancy, finance, and even a PhD. Of course, we also offer the MBA in a flexible format, perfect for working professionals, and have just added the flex weekend option for the MSBA um, as well. The Rady School also has a series of very popular undergraduate minors and three collaborative majors at UC San Diego. Each of our programs are currently being reviewed on a rolling basis within the rounds listed here. The MBA programs, both flex and full-time, have a round three deadline of April 1st, which is also the final round for international applicants, and a round four deadline of May 1st for domestic applicants seeking merit-based fellowships. The specialized master pro master's programs are all now in round three admi of admissions and will accept applications through April 1st. Again, the final deadline for international applicants to these programs, as well as their merit-based fellowship deadline. Future rounds and other deadlines may be available and are posted on our website at rady.ucsd.edu. The graduate admissions process is quite simple, really just five steps. First, we always recommend connecting with a grad, graduate admissions advisor to learn more about the program in which you're interested, to determine your preparedness and potential with the program itself. Given that the round three deadline for each of our programs is in just a couple of days, April 1st, you may want to jump to the next step. However, if you are applying to a program that has additional deadlines, you may have time to email grad ad, uh, Rady Grad Admissions at ucsd.edu to request an advising appoint, appointment as soon as possible. Second, you have to complete the application checklist. These are on our web pages and are covered in advising sessions regularly. These checklists give full details on what you must submit to be considered for admission. Most programs also have an FAQ page that I highly advise reviewing to be sure that you're ready to submit all that you need to for the program of your choice. And third, after you've submitted your application is to potentially receive a request for an interview. Now this is a highly program dependent. Before the MBA programs, you should expect an invitation to interview if you've passed the initial admissions committee review. This request may come within one to three weeks of submitting your MBA, MBA application, depending on our application load, university holidays, staff time, et cetera. 
Specialized programs may have a different timeline due to a large volume of applicants. The fourth step would be to accept admission if it is offered and to submit your enrollment deposit. This deposit holds your seat in the cohort and confirms your commitment to joining Rady at the start of your program. While these deposits are non-refundable, they do go into your student account upon enrollment in the program, so you can consider it tuition paid forward. And the fifth and final step is to get ready or get ready for a transformative professional experience. Are there any questions at this time that we can answer about um, the um, admissions process or graduate programs? Uh, if not, then we will continue on. And for now, the reason that you have all taken this time to join us is to learn from the esteemed Professor Hyoduk Shin. Uh, Professor Shin holds the Jimmy Uncle Saria uh, Presidential Chair in Innovation and Entrepreneurship here at Rady. He teaches the MBA core curriculum courses, as well as MBA electives and independent study courses. A much beloved instructor, he actually taught me last quarter, he has also taught courses for the MS um, Business Analytics Program, PhD program, as well as the Executive Education courses. He is um, nearly an annual recipient of Student Awards for Excellence in Teaching and MVP, Most Valuable Professor. And I'm sure you'll see when I give, finally give him the spotlight. Prior to joining the Rady School, Shin was in a, an assistant professor at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. At Kellogg, he won chairs Core Course Teaching Award. Shin earned a PhD from Stanford University, um, an MS in Statistics from the University of Chicago, and an MS in Management Engineering, and a BS in Industrial Engineering from the Career Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Professor Shin's research interests include collaboration and information sharing in supply chains, forecasting and innovation investments in supply chains, open source software and network securities, and the motion picture industry and operations uh, marketing interface. Um, Professor Shin is basically Rady's own in-house TED Talk speaker with a number of presentations on the Rady YouTube channel from supply chains, uh, insights and modifications in pandemic, which was part of our market impacts of COVID-19 faculty webinar series from his work with the Institute for the Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation, um, so ISEI, titled Envisioning the Future of Global Supply Chains. And what is supply chain and why is it important? A presentation about Rady's undergrad supply chain minor and uh, collaborations with UCSD's um, Data Science Institute to today's online masterclass for prospective and incoming Rady students. Professor Shin is a man of many talents, and we are very pleased to welcome him, uh, welcome him here today. Professor Shin, if you are ready, uh, please lead us through this online masterclass on how supply chains change the retail industry. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, I'm really flattered. Okay, folks, uh, thanks all again for joining this uh, online class. Um, let's, without further ado, let's begin. Okay. So um, Amy, can you enable me to share the screen? Yes. Thank you. So today I'll talk about the retailing industry in particular related to the supply chains and how the retailing industry has changed uh, in particular leveraging the supply chains. So let me share my screen. Okay. Right, so let's let's begin. Um, so to begin with this, uh, the retailing industry, let me start with a little bit of a history of retailing industry. Right? So if you think about the retailing industry, to begin with, uh, it was around 19, 1895, started with a little push carts, right? People come with the push carts and sell things to the villages. That's the beginning. However, one big, uh, innovation happened in 1916, and that was the year when the world first supermarket came along. Okay, and that world first supermarket was Piggly Wiggly. Um, so that supermarket is a great innovation in many ways. First of all, compared to a push cart, the supermarket Piggly Wiggly was big, much bigger than the typical push cart. Okay. 
In addition to that, uh, the way that they innovated is, um, first of all, before Piggly Wiggly, the typical way of shopping was people will come with their notes on what to buy. Okay? And then they will give that notes to the clerk. And the clerk will then go to the store space and then pick things up and then give it to the people, the customers, and then the customers will then pay. Okay, that was the, the way of business of selling things before Piggly Wiggly. However, Piggly Wiggly came up with this great idea of supermarket in which what they did was they asked customers to work for them. Okay, what do I mean by that? They said, instead of them getting the notes and then go there and pick things up, they asked customers to go there and pick things up. What kind of apples that they want, what kind of cucumbers that they want. It was the work for them. Now it's the work for customers, right? In the supply chain world, we call that outsource, right? So they outsource their own work to the customers without paying them a penny. What a great idea, right? In addition to that, when they did that, although customers doing the work for them, for Piggly Wiggly, cost customers were actually happier, right? They were happy to work by themselves, right? So that brought this idea of supermarkets. Now, if you think about that idea, that idea itself is, again, it's 1916, pretty old, but at the same time, it's still active, right? Think about what uh, Starbucks did in terms of their online apps of ordering, right? Specifically, it's, it's the same idea, meaning typically it was the Starbucks agent's work to take orders from the customers. Now, they don't have to do that. Now, customers are doing the work for Starbucks. And to some extent, for some customers like myself included, I like that. I like that doing it myself, sometimes ordering, go, go to the agent and ordering takes time. And also it can be confusion and things like that. Now I like it. I like it doing by myself, although it's a work for me, I like it, right? That again, outsourcing it to customers. If you think about any, any, any industry where you are, right? If you think about that kind of ideas in which I can actually outsource it to customers, it's a less work for me and also, customers are happier with that, that I will say it's a great innovation, right? So that is one of the retailing innovation in the world of a supermarket. Now that's the past. Now let's think about the current, right? In terms of the current, as I said, Piggly Wiggly was a big supermarket. However, if you look at it now, that's small, right? In terms of the scale, it's even bigger these days, right? Let's say Costco, Walmart and Whole Foods, in terms of the scales, it's much bigger than Piggly Wiggly, right? However, there's a reason why I picked those three companies, okay? Although, again, in terms of the scale, they are all big. However, they are all different, okay? First of all, Walmart, right? In terms of the scale, it's, it is really big. And there is, a, why, there is a reason why companies are seeking for that scale. By doing business in a really big way, it becomes cheaper, okay? Why it becomes cheaper? First of all, think about if you have a big supermarket, right? It's not the case that you need to have thousands of them, right? Maybe you can just have hundreds of them to cover the whole United States. Meaning if you have to actually ship it from the suppliers to the store, you don't have to ship it to 1,000 different stores. You can just ship it to 100 different stores in a big scale. With that, there will be an economies of scale. Right? So that, you can actually save cost. Right? So that is, if you save cost, then you can also sell it cheaper to customers. Right? So that is the advantage of Walmart. Now, Costco is, is uh, slightly different. It's, it's big. Uh, that's the same. However, if you think about Costco, what are the typical, let's say, best sellers in Costco, right? In terms of the best sellers in Costco, believe it or not, Costco is very famous for selling toilet papers, right? Toilet papers. And now there is a reason why Costco is selling toilet papers and toilet papers being their number one seller. Okay. Now, first of all, in Costco's case, different from Walmart, it's membership based. 
Now, what does it mean? In terms of membership base, for, they will get their membership fees from the customers. Not only that, they know who their customers are. There will be some surprises, but most likely they know exactly how many customers that they have because of their membership. Right? So in that sense, if you think about their demand forecasting, right? It is extremely easy to forecast the demand of customers in Costco's case. They know how many customers that they have through the membership. And also think about toilet papers, so in particular, the demand of toilet papers. Right? Unlike other things, let's say if you see those whole foods, for example, the grapes or the pumpkins, right? Forecasting how many grapes to sell, how many pumpkins to sell, that's, that's hard. Some weeks you may want grapes, some weeks you may want apples. However, every week you need toilet papers. In terms of the demand, if you know how many customers you have, and if you see their demand of toilet papers, you know exactly, pretty much, how many toilet papers that you will sell every week. Right. Meaning, in terms of Costco's planning of their inventories, it's very easy. They don't have to keep tons of toilet papers to sell for one month, right? They know exactly how many toilet papers that they will sell, for example, this week and next week, and they can stock that much, and then they sell, and then they ship it. Right? That is one particular aspect of Costco. Right? Another one is Whole Foods. Now, Whole Foods case, it's a differentiator, right? Now, even if you think about the supply chains, the key is it, not only supply chains, actually, whenever you think about your business, you have to think about what is your differentiator, right? If you wanna compete with Walmart, you don't want to say, hey, my differentiator will be selling cheap. Good luck with that, right? Walmart is already occupying that territory, right? Whole Foods case, their differentiator is obviously different. It's a little bit of a high end, focusing on the groceries. Their margins are thick compared to others, right? That is their differentiator. With that, their supply chains will be also different. The way that they do their business, although they're in the same retailing business, the way that they deal with their suppliers, the way that they actually serve their customers, they are different, right? That is really the key differentiator for Whole Food, even in terms of the customer segment, it is different and that then should matter in terms of their supplier management as well. Right. So now that is the retailing of the present, which is scale, right? It's all in big scale, relatively big scale. However, scale is not everything. Okay, let me give you a few examples, okay? One is this store, 7-Eleven, okay? Not a typical 7-Eleven that you know, but if you actually see a little more details on that 7-Eleven sign, they are actually Japanese, okay? It is actually 7-Eleven Japanese, okay? Now, if you think about 7-Eleven in Japan, first of all, they don't have any scale, right? Their scale is, is not there. Uh, in particular, think about big cities like in Tokyo, right? Their real estate price is really high and you cannot have a Walmart scale or Costco scale. It is literally too expensive, right? Also their focus is in convenience store, meaning they need to have a lot of them, right? Even in Tokyo, it's gotta be the case that they it is not the case that they have one 7-Eleven Japan serving the whole Tokyo. It's got to be the case that in every corner, there's got to be 7-Eleven Japan, right? So they don't have any scale. But nonetheless, even all this under COVID and, you know, with the stagnation in Japan, 7-Eleven Japan was actually expanding, right? And also, they are actually having almost everything. Right? It's a convenience store, meaning they need to have everything. Right? Then the key is, hey, um, I can understand how Walmart has everything, right? Because they stock everything in a big, look, big store. Right? In 7-Eleven Japan's case, 
how, how can they sell everything? Right? They don't have a space to, to shelf everything. Nonetheless, if you go there, they have everything. Right? If I go there, well, I've never been to 7-Eleven Japan yet, but I had many students who visited 7-Eleven Japan before. And what they told me is, let's say first thing in the morning, you go to the 7-Eleven Japan. And unlike here in the States, the typical things that 7-Eleven Japan sells in the morning, all those foods, right? Rice balls, that is all there in the morning. And also, let's say even in the after, you know, let's say in the evening, if you are coming back from work and going back home, and you drop by 7-Eleven Japan, you just want to pick up a few beers, let's say. And 7-Eleven Japan has them. Right? How come then? How can that be possible that that tiny store has everything without scale? Right? That's one. Another one is. It's expensive, right? As I explained in Costco's and Walmart's with the big store, they do have economies of scale. It's much easier to transport things from the suppliers to the big store with the big uh, 18 wheeler. In 7-Eleven Japan, they cannot ship it through 18 wheeler in the city of Tokyo, right? The, the, the roads are just too tiny, right? Then, how can they, which means actually everything is expensive, right? To some extent, 7-Eleven Japan's case, things are expensive. Don't get me wrong, things are expensive. The key here, the differentiator here is, actually it is expensive, but as long as you have what customer wants, customers are willing to pay, right? Customers are willing to pay. So that is another key, which is, Whenever you do think about the retailing, the key is there are customer segments and there are product segments in which cost matters, right? If it is the case that customers are willing to drive to go to Costco store, or if we are willing to drive for 30 minutes to go to Walmart to get that 10% discount compared to others, it makes sense to have big stores to serve that segment of customers. However, if it is the case that, hey, I am busy, I cannot drive for 30 minutes to go to uh, Walmart for 10% discount, um, I, I'll just pay a little higher price to just drive five minutes to Vons and then buy things from there. Right? That's if there is such a segment of customers as well as certain products that it makes sense to serve those. Right? In addition, it also depends on the product types. Right? If it is like toilet papers, yes, it makes sense to have that sort of a model of Costco's because it's much easier to predict the demand. However, if it becomes like, let's say the grapes, pumpkins, or the things that is really hard to forecast, then it becomes harder to actually do a small store like that because you don't know what customers will want, right? In that case, actually, it's, it's better to have a big store so that at least if you aggregate all the customers, there will be less of a uncertainty, right? So in that sense, depending on the uh, product types as well as the customers, there might be some differentiations both in terms of a, the designing the retailing as well as a um, designing the supply chains, right? Now, this is one example of a small store uh, still surviving well. And there is another example from my home country, which is Korea. So if you think about uh, this, uh, one of my friend taking photos, where do you think he is? Well, it's not here yet in the States but he is actually in the subway station, right? So in the subway station that, you know, in a typical retail industry, right? That photo is exactly the same as the placement of the refrigerator in every Tesco Home Plus, right? So you know where to look at. So now my friend is taking the photos with the app 
on the way to go to work right? and then put it in the basket. And then that will be then delivered before he go, go home in the evening. Right? So that's another sort of a business model. And it's not only on the subway stations, right? It's also in uh, bus stations. As long as you have time to do something else, you have time to wait, that valuable time will not be wasted. The companies will look at that time and try to grab your attention, right? So that's one point that I wanna make. Another point that I wanna make is, and we will talk about the retailing of the future, right? However, one of the key sort of a cost implication of that is, in this case, as I said, customers will order online and then somebody will deliver it to customers, right? That delivery called a last mile delivery, it is very costly, right? Think about that. One reason why companies are going big is to enjoy economies of scale using those big 18 wheelers, right? I mean, it's not only 18 wheelers. You saw what happens to those Suez canals with the huge ship, right? There is a reason why those ships becoming bigger and bigger, not only carrying thousands of containers, that ship carried almost 20,000 containers, right? And there is a reason why companies and ships are going bigger and bigger. Clearly one reason is the cost, right? So in that sense, actually shipping in a big scale from the suppliers, from the manufacturing plant to the big box retailers, that's cheap. What's expensive is the things that you cannot do with 18 wheelers, that you cannot do with those big ship, right? in particular, that last mile delivery. Right? from the retail stores to the com customer's homes. That is very expensive, right? That last mile delivery, you cannot do it with 18 wheelers. You gotta do it with the Uber. We gotta do it with small trucks. It is expensive, right? And with that, somebody has to pay. The key question is, who will pay, right? Or in other words, are the customers willing to pay for that, right? Yes, it is convenient that I don't have to go for shopping, but hey, I am shopping for $200. Am I willing to pay 20 bucks for the delivery? If so, then it makes sense. For some products you may, some maybe not. Right? So you really also have to think about what kind of products customers are actually willing to pay. Right? Some products, let's say uh, diapers, right? One of, one of the key aspects of diapers is actually, it's very similar to, um, to some extent, toilet papers. The demand is pretty stable, right? As long as you have a baby and depending on how old they are, you know, number of times that they will poop, it's, it's pretty much a constant, right? So in that sense, the demand is pretty much stable, very easy to forecast. However, think about, let's say, actually in terms of retailing of the present, those are the retailing of the present, you know who are the retailing of the future. Well, at this point, it's almost now. So it's retailing of the current as well, but retailing of the future, I will say, as everyone knows, it's Amazon, right? But there is a reason why Amazon bought diapers.com but Amazon didn't buy and never will never buy uh, toilet paper companies, right? Why? Think about, as I said, how much customers are willing to pay. Although those two are very easy to forecast in terms of the demand, toilet papers, one, it's extremely bulky and expensive to deliver, but also, it's not like newly having babies couples, you know, the new couples having babies. Right? Toilet papers, everyone needs it. And uh, typically customers are willing to drive for 10 or 20 minutes to buy 10% discount on toilet papers. However, diapers, uh, those couples with the baby, just the newborn baby, they don't have time. 
Like for them, that 20 minute or an hour shopping time, that's the money, meaning they are willing to pay for it, right? With that, Amazon comes, hey, there is a customers right, who are willing to pay for it. Let's go for it, right? So in that sense, it makes sense. Now though, Amazon is one thing, strange thing happened, right? Which is in Amazon's case, it's about scale, right? Amazon is in delivery business. It delivers from typically their distribution centers and their distribution centers are huge, right? which has a lot of scale. That's, I mean, especially if you think about the history of Amazon, that's how Amazon killed, let's say the borders or Barnes and Nobles. Right. First, Barnes and Noble came and then killed all those mom and pop stores with the scale. And Amazon came with the, hey, you talk about the scale, Barnes and Noble stores are big, but let me show you my distribution center, right? which is even bigger than Barnes and Noble. And Amazon came and killed Barnes and Nobles. But think about what happened recently. Strangely enough, Amazon actually built their own bookstores, their own mom and pop bookstores without scale. What happened? Clearly Jeff Bezos is not a stupid guy. He, there should be a reason why, okay? While you are thinking about it, let me just detour a little bit to give you an answer, in particular going into another industry, which is a movie industry, okay? In the movie industry, um, there are also multiple stakeholders. First of all, there are studios who are making contents and then they distribute that contents in multiple cha channels. One channel is the theaters. Another channel is selling DVDs. In particular, Walmart is actually one of the big DVD sellers and also some rentals like Blockbusters, Netflix and Redbox, right? And uh, these days also streamings, right? Amazon and iTunes. Okay. Now. The, this is a Amazon, oh, not Amazon, but movie industry supply chain, okay? Now in this movie industry supply chain, there are multiple stakeholders. And with that, there, there can be interesting dynamics in particular related to technology advances. Right? Think about what happens now. In the past, right, you cannot have your movie theater at home, right? TV quality versus theater quality, it's very different. Now it's pretty similar, right? I will say you can have that experience of movie theaters, at least in terms of the quality of the movie and the sound and everything. It's, I mean, it's not the same, but it, it's pretty similar, right? And also distributing the content became much easier in particular than before, right? I mean, you can streaming the videos or the movies, what can be easier than that? With that, the whole dynamics changed, right? In the past, actually theaters and even Walmart had a big things to say, demand a lot of things to studios, right? Even in Walmart actually demanded all the studios saying, hey, if you guys wanna, uh, uh, let's say release your DVDs, it's gotta be on Tuesdays. Right? Walmart demanded that and the studios had to follow whatever Walmart says. Right? Although if you think about it, that doesn't make any sense. If you wanna release the DVDs or videotapes, why Tuesdays, right? I mean, why not Fridays or Saturdays? That's exactly when the movie theaters release the new movies. Right? However, Walmart said so. And in this case, actually Walmart's perspective was, hey, at, I, as a Walmart, I know that Tuesdays, it's the least traffic, least store traffic, right? So at least if, if the new movie DVD is coming on Tuesdays, some people will come to Walmart on Tuesdays to buy, let's say those DVDs. And with that, they will not come and buy only DVDs. They may pick up a few other things as well, which is good for Walmart. So let's demand studios to actually release the DVDs only on Tuesdays. However, now, as I said, because of the technology, distributing content became much easier. With that, the negotiation power also changed. Right? Now, it's not the case that Walmart has that much of a power. It is not the case that theaters also has a lot of negotiation, negotiation power, not anymore. Right? 
Now, at this point, the key is really all about who are the content owners, right? Because of that easiness of distributing content, the key is who has the content, right? With that, people will adapt. People will adapt and companies will adapt, right? Think about even Netflix, even Amazon, right? Even uh, other companies, what are they doing? Netflix and Amazon, they were in the content distribution business, not anymore, right? Both realizing that, hey, content owner is now the king, both Netflix and Amazon, they actually went into that business of creating their own content, right? Otherwise, those studios can easily eat up those other players. Right? So in that, with the technology advances, even in terms of who is the king, who has more negotiation power, that will change in the whole value chain. Right? With that, I just, just want to discuss a little bit about a Blockbuster and Netflix. Right? So first of all, Blockbuster. Right? The story of Blockbuster here is a simple story, which is um, the way that Blockbuster actually killed all those mom and pop stores, it's pretty much very similar to a Barnes and Nobles and the Borders, right? With the scale, right? Instead of mom and pop, small store, Blockbuster came with the big store, right? And with that, they killed all those mom and pop rentals and they dominated, right? However, what happened to Blockbuster now? Unfortunately, there is only one Blockbuster chain in the whole world, which is in Bend, Oregon. So next time when you have a chance to travel to Bend, Oregon, make sure that you drop by there to see the last blockchain, uh, Blockbuster store. I bet their days are even numbered, right? So make sure that you check it there before they're gone, right? So Blockbuster now dominated that rental market with the scale. However, there is a reason why they are not any more Blockbuster stores, which is who killed the Blockbuster? It is, as you know, it's Netflix. Again, the way that Netflix killed Blockbuster, it's pretty much the same as the way that Amazon killed Barnes & Noble. Let's go for the scale. Look at the Netflix distribution center. Blockbuster is big. They can carry tens of thousands of copies. Netflix distribution center can, can carry tens of millions of copies, right? So Blockbuster cannot handle in terms, cannot match the scale of Netflix distribution centers. Now that's one way that again, Netflix dominated the Blockbuster and uh, concurred the industry of rentals. However, not yet. Um, I bet some of you know this company, the opposite of Amazon. Instead of Amazon, we have Redbox, right? So the Redbox, actually, Netflix killed Blockbuster, right? Big Blockbuster stores. But Netflix, even now, couldn't kill that small little Redbox. Why? If Netflix can kill that blockbuster, why not this Redbox? It Redbox is almost like mom and pop store, even smaller than mom and pop store, right? If you actually see inside that little Redbox, it's not thousands of copies, it's hundreds of copies, right? Typically 500 or 600, right? So number of copies, it's pretty small in Redbox. Even compared to mom and pop stores, it's smaller than that, but still Netflix couldn't kill Redbox. Why is that? Right? Why even with that big scale, Netflix couldn't kill Redbox? Right? Here really it comes about product choice. Right? As I said, Costco's case, it's not the case that they keep every single product. Costco is actually known for having a limited 
a stock keeping units. Right? Typical Walmart stores have 50,000 SKUs. Costco's only 5,000 SKUs, very limited variety. So their product choice, Costco's product choice is very particular. Redbox also the same. If you think about what kind of movies that Redbox keeps in that little red box, it's not every single videos. It's not every single DVDs. If you want the DVDs that was released last year, good luck with that. Redbox keeps only those movies that's, that are recently released. What does that mean? If they are the recently released movies, you know that customers want it. You really don't have to forecast what's the demand. You know that there is demand. Right? So you actually turn over those videotapes pretty quickly. You stock it, those recently released movies, you rent it, and after two weeks, again, you just stock those newly released DVDs and then you rent it. And then after two weeks, again, you turn it really fast. If it is the movies that you don't know whether people will want it or not, you have to keep those movies for a while to test it. For them, they don't have any, any freedom to test. Right? They only keep those products that they know that people will rent. Right? That is why it becomes extremely hard, even for Netflix's scale, to beat the red box. It is extremely hard to enjoy those economies of scale if you keep those products that's known to sell easily and fast. Right? With that, let me come back to Amazon. Okay? So in Amazon's story, as I said, they started with this scale, the big scale. Right, with really, really big scale. And that's the way that they dominated. Now, however, they are doing this, little Amazon stores. And even in terms of fresh food, they have Amazon Go as well, just like actually 7-Eleven Japan, very tiny space. Right. Now, the reason why they can do those is actually pretty similar to, to some extent, Red box. Okay. Why? Now, in terms of products, they keep all kinds of products. What's different is, think about what Amazon knows about you. Think about what Amazon knows what you will buy. I am sure they know more about you than yourself. In particular, about what, what, will, what you will buy. So in that sense, they basically made, Amazon made, because of their data that they have, the information that they have, all those products that Amazon keep, they know you will come and buy, right? So it's not the case that they will stock and then say, hope that, okay, let me just keep this book right here and people will come and pick it up. No, they know exactly, okay, if we will stock this, people will come and buy. Well, actually, I know that somebody is driving to buy this book. Let me keep it right there, right? With that power of data and information, they can actually keep it in a small scale, right? Even in that small bookstore, even in Amazon Go, even without the scale, right? even without the actual scale, they made all the products just like a toilet paper. They know exactly when the customers will come and want to buy, right? So that's one way to enjoy that economies of scale, even without the economies of scale, without the physical actual economies of scale, which is in the information and the data. With that, I'll wrap it up here. If you have any questions, feel free to type it in the chat and I'll be happy to answer. Ah, okay, so one question Ali, Ali and, uh, asked, so if let's say Amazon with their advanced supply chain is really testing the last mile of delivery, 
Well, don't quote me on this, but my bet is for sure, yes. In particular, if I am the CEO of UPS, I'll be extremely worried, right? And, and as a matter of fact, my, my personal opinion is the days of UPS is just, you know, numbered, right? I mean, think about, even think about, let's say these days, how many Amazon trucks you see with that, I mean, literally, uh, UPS, uh, actually, Amazon canceled their contract with UPS, right? And that's not a small contract. UPS, substantial revenue was coming from Amazon, and without it, and Amazon were picking up even more trucks. I, I mean, it just, it, I don't see the way that UPS can beat Amazon, right? So... The, my short answer is, my guess is yes, the last mile delivery in terms of, you know, last mile delivery is extremely hard to enjoy the economies of scale. However, with Amazon's information and the data, they are the best sort of seated in knowing exactly where to deliver and how efficiently to deliver the last miles, right? So with that, I'm, my, my answer, my short answer will be yes. Oh, the real estate market, well, <laughs> and, and similar to McDonald's. Well, that's, I will go even further, right? Uh, my prediction will be soon enough, we will not be living in the United States of America, we'll be living in Amazon Republic. <laughs> uh, who knows? Uh, you can imagine Amazon will not just dominate the real estate market, they may become a real estate brokerage company, right? What happens if they buy Redfin, let's say? Right, um, as, as you know, Redfin started now, right? They are experimenting it, not just brokeraging those, um, you know, home selling, right? They are actually participating as a buyer and they sell it themselves, right? To the, to the customers after buying it from other customers. Right? You know, M let's say Redfin has this much of a capital, Amazon has that much of a capital, right? So, Again, who knows? Not only real estate market, but one day Amazon may become a real estate brokerage company. Right? I mean, you sell things, uh, pretty much everything through Amazon. Soon enough, Amazon will sell cars. Soon enough, you can imagine, Amazon will sell houses. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, also in terms of Amazon, uh, one thing that we didn't discuss is even the web services, right? Amazon web services. So um, that's, that's definitely another story. Um, if you wanna hear that Amazon web services, come to the class, join Ready, and you'll hear more about Amazon web services as well. <laughs> Right, thank you, Professor Shin. Um, are there any questions for Professor Shin or for um, any of the admissions staff? Uh, you feel free to unmute or you can put your questions into the chat. Looks like there's a lot of questions about Amazon. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Is it a good time to buy Amazon stock? That I don't know. <laughs> Because as you know, uh, it is extremely hard to beat, uh, beat the market. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is just a little sample of um, the amazing class that you can take here at Rady. Professor Shin is an amazing professor. So um, he's definitely, I definitely really enjoyed his class last quarter and look forward to hopefully learning more from him. But feel free to ask any other questions. Um, so there is a question if this material will be covered in operations management. Uh, good, good question. I mean, uh, Amy, you can even answer it. Uh, the short answer is actually little part of it will be covered in um, operations class. Big part of it will be actually covered in supply chain class. 
And we do have a uh, supply chain cert certification, so that's also available. Any other questions? Um, but I'll feel free to um, leave if you need to get going, but I'll be on here for a little while longer if anyone has questions. Um, so feel free to shoot or unmute your, um, your microphone. Great, thank you, Amy. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Wow. It looks like we have one more question, Professor Shin, if you are still around. Um, it says, what are the big supply chain B2P uh, software suppliers? Ooh, so um, actually, that's an interesting question, right? Um, in terms of, first of all, the, the answer, B2B, B2B software suppliers, I will say SAP is, is one big one. There are other ones as well, um, uh, but you can also imagine Amazon is developing its own one, right? But one thing that I want to say is not only B2B, um, there are things that you can also imagine that happened from B2B, but even to B2C, right? I mean, one example that I can think of is, as I said, think about the toilet papers, right? Um, if you think about toilet papers, one thing is, why are we actually going to pick it up, right? Or even why are we ordering uh, toilet papers, right? Because that is just so stable demand. You need what you need. Companies like Costco, they know, right? They know exactly when we need it, how much we need it. And with that, why don't we actually let Costco do everything for us, right? We don't even have to order, right? We will just, you know, you know my demand. What you will do is you will actually order and deliver everything to me. All I will say, all I will do is just pay, right? That uh, exactly like, uh, uh, you know, either BOPO or BOPOS, let's say, uh, that's, you know, you, you know that Amazon also has those easy buttons, right? If you are ready to order, you just you know, push the button and it'll be ordered automatically or you, you talk to Alexa to do it. But I will say, you know, maybe you don't even need to do it. You know, 100% autonomous, right? We don't have to do anything. Right? And now um, uh, I was actually curious what, why there, there wasn't such a thing, because if you think about B2B environment, it's there already. Right? It's there already, meaning Walmart is doing it. It's called a vendor managed inventory, meaning let's say Walmart is not actually ordering things. Let's say Walmart ordering toothpaste to, to Johnson & Johnson, right? As long as we are about to, let's say, um, stock out uh, toothpastes, uh, Walmart will order Johnson & Johnson to deliver the uh, toothpaste to Walmart. Walmart is not doing it anymore. Right. What Walmart is doing is vendor managed inventory, meaning Walmart to share their demand with Johnson and Johnson and Johnson and, and then assign the shelf space to Johnson and Johnson. And in terms of ordering and inventory management, Johnson and Johnson will do on behalf of Walmart. Right? So in that sense, why not doing it us in B2C in that sense, why don't we let, let's say Amazon or, or Costco to manage our inventory of toilet papers so that we don't even have to worry about it. So in that sense, really uh, nowadays, I see that that sort of a boundary of B2B and B2C gets a little bit blurred as well. And then one last question, it's, um, is sustainable supply chain the future? Ooh, sustainability is, is a big question, okay? It's, it's a really big question. And the only thing that I will add though is it is really up to customers, right? Um, I have done some research related to sustainability and the cost. What I have seen is so far, still customers, if it's cheaper, some customers will go for it, right? Sustainability, there is a sliver of areas in which the products become more sustainable at the same time it becomes cheaper, okay? In that cases, I think it's an easy solution. Yes, we, go, we should go for it. But in many cases, right, if you go after uh, sustainability, sometimes it just becomes a little bit more expensive. However, the key is what does customer want? 
right? Do we want to pay for that, right? Do we want to pay for, let's say, the company's product who are doing business in a more ethical way or who are doing business in a more sustainable way or more environmentally friendly way? If so, yes. However, it really hinges on the customers, right? As long as customers are looking for cheaper cost, I mean, again, think about the toilet papers. Do you really care about sustainability when you buy toilet papers? Or let's say, you know, that is 10% cheaper toilet papers, let's go buy for that, right? If customers are willing to pay for it, it'll be, it'll come. However, without it, it'll be a tough, tough battle to win.